Getting good at something takes a whole lot of practice, and programming in Python is no different. We recommend that you practice every example we share in this course on your own. If you don't have Python installed on your machine, no worries. You can still practice using an online Python interpreter. Check out the next reading for links to the most popular Python interpreters available online. Now, I'm sure you're wondering, what the heck is a Python interpreter? <laughs> in programming, an interpreter is the program that reads and executes code. Remember how we said a computer program is like a recipe with step-by-step -step instructions? Well, if your recipe is written in Python, the Python interpreter is the program that reads what's in the recipe and translates it into instructions for your computer to follow. Eventually, you'll want to install Python on your computer so you can run it locally and experiment with it as much as you like. We'll guide you through how to install Python in the upcoming course, but you don't have to have it installed to get your first taste of Python. Now that you've got an idea of what Python code looks like, let's check out one of the most basic examples and dive deeper into what's going on. Get ready. We're going to use a Python interpreter to make our computers say hello to the world. When we run this code, either locally on our machine or on a web interpreter, the words hello world appear on the screen, just like magic. Actually, it's not magic. <laughs> it's because print is a Python function that writes what we tell it to on the screen. Like the statement, hello world, for example. The print function is part of the basic Python language. Whenever we use keywords or functions that are part of the language, we're using the programming language's syntax to tell the computer what to do. So what are functions and keywords? Functions are pieces of code that perform a unit of work. We'll talk a lot more about functions later on, and you'll even learn how to write your own. Keywords are reserved words that are used to construct instructions. These words are the core part of the language and can only be used in specific ways. Some examples include if, while, and for. We'll explain all of those and a bunch more later in the course. As we called out, the keywords and functions used in Python are what makes up the syntax of the language. Once we understand how they work, we can use them to construct more complex expressions that get the computer to do what we want it to do. Last off, notice how hello world is written between double quotation marks. Wrapping text in quotation marks indicates that the text is considered a string, which means it's text that will be manipulated by our script. In programming, any text that isn't inside quotation marks is considered part of the code. Now for a bit of trivia. Do you know why we greeted the whole world in our example? Well, printing hello world has been the traditional way to start learning a programming language since way back in the 70s when it was used as the first example in a famous programming book called the C programming language. That example looked like this. In Python, the hello world example is just one line. In C, it's three lines. In other languages, it could be even more. While learning to write hello world won't teach you the whole language, it gives you a first impression of how functions are used and how a program written in that language looks. All right, now that we've written our first piece of Python code, I think you're ready for something a bit more challenging than hello world. Ready? Let's do it. On the whole, for a program to be useful, it needs to get at least some information from the user. With this data, the program can take actions that are relevant to the user instead of generic actions like printing hello world. Data can be provided to a computer in a bunch of different ways. For example, on a website, you might input data by entering text into text fields or clicking links. If you're using a mobile application, maybe you'll click on buttons or select preferences from a drop-down menu. In a command line program, you might provide additional data by passing strings as parameters to the program, or you could have the program ask you for data interactively. All these various platforms, programs, and apps process data differently. Some might take the contents of a file as data to be processed. Others gather data from other sources and process it in the background. Remember our earlier example when we automated the process of identifying and removing duplicate emails? There, the data provided to the program was the list of emails, which would usually be given in a file that lists the emails one per line. Whichever way your application gets the data, it will need to come from somewhere. For our first examples in this course, we'll just have the data as its own line in our block of code. This is limited, but straightforward. Later in this course and in upcoming courses, we'll introduce you to better ways of feeding data into your code. For now though, let's see this idea in action in a very simple example.
By having the name separate from the call to the print function, we're making the line of code that calls the print function generic, while still personalizing the greeting. If we then wanted to say hello to a different person, we only need to change the name, but the call to the print function will remain the same. Pretty simple, right? Next up, we'll learn a few other easy things that you can get Python to do for you. There's a ton of things that you could do with Python, and you'll learn many of them in this course. But before we dive into complex subjects, let's have some fun with another simple task that you could do with Python. We're going to make Python our calculator. And let's start with something easy. So 4 plus 5 is 9. 9 times 7 is 63. Minus 1 divided by 4 is minus 0.25. Easy. Repeating or periodic numbers are printed in a longer format. Let's try 1 divided by 3. In math theory, when 1 is divided by 3, the digit 3 repeats forever after the decimal point. Of course, it's hard to display something that repeats forever, so instead we have a representation showing lots of decimal places. Not too hard, right? Let's give the computer something a bit trickier. Let's say we want to divide 2050 by 5, then subtract 32, and then divide the result by 9. To do this, we'll need to use parentheses, just as we do in typical math problems. You can also use Python to get squares, cubes, or any power of n of a number. For example, let's say we want to find out what 2 to the power of 10 is. To get Python to give us the answer, we use the double star operator. If you're starting to worry that this is becoming an algebra course, relax, we're not going to do anything more complex than what we've just seen. And if you're thinking, why would I use Python instead of just a normal calculator? That's a valid question. Experimenting in this way, you get familiar with the language's math capabilities. And in IT jobs, there are many tasks that require you to use math calculations. You might need to count how many times a certain word appears in a text, or work out the average time it takes for an operation to complete, or how much you have to compress an image to fit in certain size constraints. Whatever you need to calculate, writing a script can help you do it faster and with more accuracy. So you need to know what mathematical operations are available to you. Python actually has a lot more advanced numeric capabilities that are used for data analysis, statistics, machine learning, and other scientific applications. We won't get into these in this course, but if you want to learn more about them on your own, there's a wealth of online resources available.